everybody has to realize that you are an investor. At the end of the day, you are an investor. So, and you are a steward of time, effort, energy, and capital. You cannot be a good investor and be emotionally compromised. You're listening to the Traffic and Funnel Show. Growing a sales team fast. Anybody else have questions about this? So to determine how long we spend on this. Um, hire a lot of people and then try to get them to quit as fast as you can. That's how you grow a sales team really fast. And then you'll be left with the circle of people who won't quit. And then those are your ballers. I'm not saying be abusive. I'm just saying like push them really hard. Don't give them like just throw them in the deep end. Don't don't train them. Just literally throw them and tell them to fight for their lives. Seriously, that's how we do it. At least. Yeah, I think that can also relate to to all producers, even marketers, media buyers. Like you put them to a place where they have to. You throw them into the deep end, let them swim, or not. I was. This just makes me think about Robert. Yeah. Our copywriter. He came in. He was blowing up Taylor's messages. I was ignoring him. <laughs> he wouldn't leave Taylor alone. As so I was looking at his copy, I was like, man, okay. You know, maybe we'll just try him out. So I talked to him. I was like, all right, dude, we'll bring you in. I'm going to work you like a dog. I'm not going to pay you anything. And that, to me, is an indicator to see how he'll respond. He's like, okay. <laughs> so he came in, and, I mean, he just worked like a dog, just kept showing up. And now he's an unbelievable copywriter and making great money. He, like, he just wouldn't go away. He just kept moving forward. Yeah, any questions on this? So if you're going burn and turn and you're handing pretty good leads, and you're like, well, sink or swim, well, that lead could have been a great client, right? And you're, what's, your, what's your concern around that? I would, um, I would, especially at the beginning, unless you already have a team and a roadmap, I would make them find their own leads and give them like one or two calls a day. So you're really protecting the leads from being trashed. You still take calls as the owner, and you, you give them one to two a day, and then you give them a Facebook group and you tell them to go hunt. Something like that. Yeah. What else? So on that note, we, like, we're physical therapy and chiropractic specific. I have a limiting belief on how to bring in a salesperson who doesn't have industry knowledge to do what you just advised to do. Um, is that just literally in my own mind or like what, or do I find somebody with sales experience with industry knowledge that seems like uh, a tiny minority of the population though? Well, industry knowledge can be trained pretty, pretty easy because they don't know how to, they don't know how to count the vertebrae to sell services to a chiropractor. They do need to understand the business model, which can be trained. It's very difficult to train somebody's attitude. So I will pick attitude and then train them how to do it. And most people with sales experience, I don't like them because they think they're like the top and then they're just like, no, you know, we can't get them to work basically. So does that answer that question? It's, it's a, it's a limiting belief. Yes, it is limiting. I have a follow up on that. So yeah. with bringing somebody in with low experience, is it better for us to farm that out from like our uh, physical therapy world or are we farming that out from like sales mentor and you know, finding somebody who's young into that process? Sales mentor is good. I would use sales mentor to staff it if I were you. But I don't like doing a lot of work. So that's probably why I would go that route. <laughs> it's kind of true. Staffing. Yeah, so I think so, you can probably talk to Heather or Dean. Because I think they staff them. I think it's like 5K or so for a group of candidates. Yeah. Now you have to you have to manage those people, or else they're just gonna not do anything. That's that's the issue we've had is like we'll staff we've staffed people, and they're like this person's not good, and we're like okay we'll hire them back, and they're like amazing. So 
I'm like, well, you don't know how to talk to people. That's why they didn't sell. So well, I can help you with that, though, if you want it. All right, cool. Do you want to talk about how to go evergreen? Sure. Because I feel like you did that yeah. pre-TF. So what's the scenario of what you guys are doing right now? Um, and that was bringing in really good sales. And so we decided to take that webinar and turn it into a one-week event and had a huge launch. Um, so my thing is how do we now keep the momentum going and not have to do launches all of the time, but make sure that we're keeping the flow going in between our launch cycles. Have you tried automating it? No. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think it probably is one of my limiting beliefs that my audience likes it when I show up live and they like really feed off of that energy. Um, so I'm trying to balance with like not losing that energy. Do you love doing that? I do. So that's important, right, Emily? So if you love doing it, I think, you know, you make it a part of your business and your strategy. So there's this whole concept that we have um, called floors and ceilings. But here's the thing. If, you're, if you feel like you need sustainability, right, you're at a floor and you want to maintain that floor, what do I need to implement to maintain that floor and start backing out? So this is what we use with a thinking model, inverted thinking. Like what are the pillars to accomplish that thing every single month? Right, so in your case, it would be like leads, people showing up to a webinar. You guys are doing applications. How many applications, how many sales calls. So you want to look at how you can replicate that with less energy and effort going forward. So if I were you, what I would do is, one, you have to have all the data and know what's going on. So if you don't have that, you have to get that. So because here's the thing that's going to happen. If you do turn and you automate, and then you're like, things don't work out, but you don't have data, you have no attribution, and if you don't have the confidence to, that, oh, we can figure this out, then you can go into an emotional rut, and when, then you start making decisions out of emotions, which is not good, right? So we don't want to do that, we need data. Um, and just, you, everybody has to realize that you are an investor. At the end of the day, you are an investor. So, and you are a steward of time, effort, energy and capital. You cannot be a good investor and be emotionally compromised. The way that you stay from becoming emotionally compromised is having data and attribution. So when you ask the question, why is this going wrong? You can answer that question or at least present the data to this beautiful group of amazing people, right? And that's the thing, you guys have to make sure that you're leveraging all these people here because you take all the different variables and data that everybody's essentially in the market every single day. So it's important to leverage that. So if I were you, make sure you have data, um, what's currently working. And I would just slowly start to implement automated stuff. I run them side by side. And lock in that floor. And so as you being an investor, energy effort, you're always looking at how can I get more for less energy, less effort. And that's the game that we're constantly playing. That's floors and ceilings. So how can I do $100,000 this month by maybe only doing one live webinar and three automated webinars, right? So. Who's, who are the people that I need to fulfill that? The other big piece of this, too, is the auditing. Auditing your time, right? Because you are a steward of your time, of your effort, of your energy. So making sure that you're locked in on that and you're putting your effort and energy and your time into the things that are going to help you move and bust through that ceiling, right? So whether that's 150 grand for you, 200 grand for you, whatever it might be for your business and where y'all are going. Make sense? This help everybody? That's so good. Yes. I'm telling you guys, when he talks, it's good. Yeah, I mean, my question is like, I have, you know, one of the companies that I'm that I'm working with, like we have, I have a team of like five, six people that, that work under me, um, doing a startup with a business partner, and then 
you know, on one of the other projects, like we have nobody, and uh, you know, then ghostwriting a book and all of that other stuff. So it's like that's obviously like where I'm trying to get to. But in terms of resources and capital and, and actually being able to hire those people out, like how do you manage juggling all of that while you build up kind of the reserves that you need to, you know, to outsource and delegate and scale? Prioritization. Knowing where I'm going in the next three to six months and what's the, the highest priority to get me there. So you might have to delete some things from your business or hit pause. Like the timing might be wrong. It's a mistake to think that you can do all those things and do it successfully. I would say it's better to do one thing and do it really well and do it faster and enjoy it more than have that pressure of feeling like you to do like five things if you don't have money. If you have money, then you hire good people to do it, like we have up here. Any follow-up? Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody else on this? Um, yeah, I was going to say, so when you're building a new business on top of all the other ones you've built, do you guys go in and build it first and then set up the infrastructure, or do you set up the infrastructure before you do anything? What do you mean? So um, you have like TNF, but then when you go to do wealth cap, do you just have the plan and then you hire out the executives and you have the executives go out and find the team? Or like, do you like do what you did with TNF first and like build out the offer and like everything yourselves and then hire out the team once it's cash flowing? So with wealth cap, it's completely different. It's like just a completely different industry niche business model. So we started that with Lance. L Dubs back there, and he was a guy that we'd say, hey, this is what we need to accomplish, and he would go make it happen. Um, we had the ability and the capital to do that. So to me, that's always the way I'm going to go. On the coaching, consulting, info product side, it's just our jam, dude. We just know it in and out. So I know exactly what the outcomes I want are, which is the crucial key component. If you don't have that, you don't know where you're going, what the target is, whether it's you doing it or someone else, that's where people make the mistake. So having those outcomes, those key targets, then you identify, okay, is this something that I should be doing or do, as an investor, as a steward, do I have the capital to allocate towards that by hiring someone or getting a widget or a tool to get me there faster? So again, if it's me, the thing that I'm concerned about or that I want is just the outcome. And the way that I'm going to get the most leverage as an investor is by using very little of my time because my time is worth a lot. So I use leverage through people, people who are great, like Tommy and Mike and Peyton and Blake and Robert. They can accomplish so much with me just being a part just a little, a little time. Thank you.